Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. Uh, I'd like to notify you that if you are an Emory uh, University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME, uh, a CME credit hour for attending today, the login information can be found uh, in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. And if you have any issues with this webinar or with the CME login, please send Kadiatu uh, Fofana an email or drop a note in the chat feature. So uh, this morning, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Ankar Kular uh, to give uh, our, our uh, Grand Rounds lecture. Uh, Dr. Kular received his MD degree from uh, the Jefferson Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University in 2006. He then uh, completed uh, general surgery residency at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and this also uh, included uh, a two-year research sabbatical at the Brigham and Women's Hospital focused on uh, thoracic oncology. And then following that, Dr. Kular joined us here at Emory for a uh, three-year cardiothoracic fellowship and then joined faculty in uh, 2016. Now, uh, most of you know Dr. Kular, and, and uh, it, it's an understatement to say that he's quickly become a, a vibrant member of our thoracic oncology community. He's uh, a, an expert surgeon and a really... Uh, skillful and uh, innovative investigator. Uh, his, his surgical ex expertise focuses on thoracic oncology and also in complex airway surgery. And um, uh, in terms of his investigations, uh, as you'll hear from him today, he's really uh, developed and implemented uh, strategies to collect uh, patient quality of life measures here locally at Emory, uh, which really inform our care on patients. And he is also uh, on the leading edge nationally on working on getting these outcome measures uh, in, into our national registries. Uh, Dr. Kular uh, appropriately has recently also been promoted to uh, associate professor of surgery uh, in, in our division. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll welcome Dr. Kular uh, to give us a lecture on patient reported outcomes. Thanks, Dr. Fernandez, for that very kind introduction. Um, this, is a, this is a project that Dr. Fernandez started actually back uh, uh, many years ago, and uh, I was able to, to grow and take over from him. And so his mentorship in this has really been instrumental. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, the invitation and allowing me to speak at Winship Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, the title of my talk today is gonna to be Patient Reported Outcomes in Thoracic Surgical Oncology. What are our patients really telling us? And I have uh, no financial disclosures. Uh, the outline of my talk today, so I'm gonna start by defining what patient reported outcomes are. Uh, for everyone and, and kind of review what they are, tell you why they're important, why you should care about this and why you should think about including this in your practice. Um, we'll review some of the available PRO instruments um, and talk about the ones that we chose to use in our practice. And then we'll talk about our pilot study where we integrated PROs into our lung cancer care and our lung cancer practice. And then we, from there, we'll talk about how we transitioned into using this in routine clinical practice, some of the challenges we face with using and implementing patient reported outcomes, and what some of the next steps are both locally and nationally on, on using this data. So, you know, um, cancer care is classically focused on survival, but as, uh, as we're all aware, symptom management is a cornerstone of clinical practice in, uh, in oncology, whether that be medical oncology, radiation oncology, or surgical oncology. And uh, you know, symptoms and quality of life are, very, are high priorities for our patients and their caregivers. They're not only concerned with how long they live, but they wanna know how well are they going to live. They want to know how will I feel and function if I, if, I, you know, if, if I lose half of my lung, how am I gonna breathe afterwards? How is that going to affect my day-to-day -day functioning? 
and you know many there there are several papers that have looked into the, the, whether how well we um, we understand our patients in regards to quality of life and there's a big disconnect here um, you know patients have a very different impression of what their quality of life is when compared with what their clinician thinks and so the person who's really in the best position to report on their symptoms and their quality of life is the patient themselves or their caregiver not necessarily the physician so at the most basic level Patient reported outcomes are measures of physical, mental, and emotional well being that are obtained directly from the patient or their caregiver and without any response to that, um, without any interpretation of that response by, their, by the physician. And that, this can come in a variety of different forms. It can be something as simple as at home blood pressure measurements that are, they're requiring or something like depression screening. Um, and it can include things like, you know, um, uh, monitoring for adverse side effects and questionnaires that patients are filling out or reports of how well they're functioning after they have a knee replacement surgery. And there's a variety of different ways that you can use PROs in clinical care. Uh, you can use them for needs assessment to figure out which patients need an intervention. You can use them for, to help with shared decision making to see how well someone's functioning, or whether or not they can tolerate a, a certain treatment, um, such as a, a major operation. Uh, you can use them for symptom management to monitor for adverse events, events or effects or um, symptom improvement after some intervention, well, intervention whether that be medicate, medical therapy or surgical therapy, and they can be used for outcomes assessment after treatment. And lastly, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, um, as we go through some of our local data, is they can be used for quality improvement and measurement of symptom prevalence and population management. Uh, and there's a rapidly increasing demand for the use of PROs in, uh, in our clinical practice and in our research. There are a number of medical societies that have been promoting their use, including CMS, the National Quality, Quality Forum, the American College of Surgeons, uh, FDA, um, NIH, uh, and a variety of medical specialty, specialty societies are also recommending their use. And this is the lung cancer guidelines from the American College of Chest Physicians, and they uh, state in their guidelines that in, uh, I highlighted here on the bottom right, in uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients who are undergoing curative intent therapy, they suggest that a validated health-related quality of life instrument be used at baseline clinic visits and during follow-up visits. This is just a figure of, um, of a PubMed search I did the other day for patient reported outcomes and surgery and found over 9,000 citations from 2000 to 2021. You can see the number of citations is, is exponentially increasing as we get uh, further, uh, further and further into this field. So besides you know, the endorsement from other societies, like, you know, this sounds great, but why should you bother with all this effort? Is this really something I'm gonna use in my day-to-day -day practice? Uh, and so this is, um, this is just a review of some quality of life and PRO studies that have been published in lung cancer surgery, surgery care and some examples of some studies. And this is just a small sampling of what's, out, of what's been reported on this topic for lung cancer. Uh, and there are a variety of pap papers with uh, a variety of sample sizes, different instruments used, um, different um, time frames, and different aims. But they, they've been used for things like comparing comparative effectiveness research, comparing minimally invasive VATs versus thoracotomies, for monitoring symptom recovery two years after surgery, comparing lobectomies with sleeves, uh, with, with pneumonectomies, and monitoring how patients recover compared uh, with, with, with these two different uh, surgeries. But the one I wanted to highlight the most here is this paper from published in 2016 of 809 patients. They did a single assessment of um, quality of life after uh, lung cancer surgery, and then followed these patients for one year survival. And they found that Physical function scores, dyspnea, personal strength, anxiety, they're all independent predictors of, of survival at one year. Uh, and so there's a variety of different ways that you can, reasons you should use this. So, okay, so I've convinced you, you wanna use patient reported outcomes. Where do you start? How do you start using this? So the first step here is to develop and validate a PRO instrument that you want to use uh, in your patient population. And thankfully, this is, you know, a lot of this work has already been done. There are there are dozens of different instruments that are available that are that are that have been well validated and are available for use. Some are free, some require um, you know, some nominal fee, but there's there are dozens of instruments, and we'll go over a few of them. Then once you've picked your instrument, you have to figure out how are you going to administer it. So you're going to do this electronically. Is it going to be paper form? Are you going to do it in the office? Are you going to do it at home? How are you going to collect the data? How are you going to, um, you know, manage manage the data? Um, and, you know, it, it should be a no-brainer that electronic survey administration uh, and data collection is not often the easiest way to do this. It allows you to do this in a variety of different settings and kind of helps with data management afterwards. 
Once you have a way of administering the, the survey, then you have to look into how do you integrate this in real time into the electronic medical records that it's available for the clinician to use. You have to look into including this in clinical registries and in clinical trials so that we can use this for research purposes, for comparative effectiveness research and guideline development, um, and to, to guide how we treat patients. And then the combination of, of, of real-time use of this data as well as incorporation into our, into our research will allow us to really focus on patient-centered care on what really matters to our patients uh, beyond just um, survival. So next I wanted to talk about some of the PRO instruments that are available and you can kind of break this into two broad categories. There are generic, uh, generic questionnaires that can be used to measure sort of global health measures, and then there are disease or field specialty specific instruments. Uh, and so uh, on the left, there's just a, a short list of some of the available generic questionnaires. These include the PROMIS instruments that are available through the NIH, which we'll talk about a lot more here shortly. There's the MD Anderson symptom inventory, the RAND short forms, the SF36 and SF12, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and, and, and a variety of other instruments that all each have their own pros and cons. Um, and then they have ones that are specific to your to your field. So some of, some of them that are specific to us that we considered and looked at were the uh, EORTC modules, which are some of the more commonly used cancer um, cancer PRO instruments. And the, there's there's the generic one, which is the QLQC30, which is a more of a global health measure. And then there's ones that are disease specific, such as the esophageal model or the lung cancer module. There's the lung can lung cancer symptom scale. Um, there are gastrointestinal quality of life indices, reflux indices. These can get as broad or as narrow as you think is, would be helpful to you. So this is an example of the Rotterdam symptom checklist. This is a paper form that you can use. You can see this is a very um, sort of generic questionnaire um, with, with, with like open-ended questions, um, lack of appetite, irritability, tiredness, and the patients can answer this. This is, this is an example of a paper form that can be collected. And you know, paper forms have their advantages. They're easy to administer, but the data management data collection is harder. Uh, and most, most of these instruments have moved towards electronic administration. This is an example of the SF20 uh, RAND uh, survey uh, that's based that you can obtain via the RAND uh, health webpage. Um, uh, and as I said, most of these instruments have been used, uh, have been moved to electronic uh, administration. It starts with a generic question in general, would you say your health is, and then it gives a variety of scores. And then they get the questions get a little bit more specific is uh, on the bottom there, whereas looking into very specific activities, such as can you climb up a few flights of stairs or can you bend, can you walk one block? Um, picking the right instrument for your for your, um, for your needs is, is, is important and it just, it's, it's gonna be different depending on what you're looking at and how you want to implement the survey. So the instrument that we chose was the PROMIS metrics, and there's a few reasons that we chose it. So PROMIS, or the Patient Reported Outcome Inf Measurement Information System, is an NIH-funded initiative that was developed uh, a few decades ago now at this point in the um, late 90s, early 2000s. It was an NIH-funded initiative, as I said, where they were looking to develop a, a, set, a series of instruments that were globally available to the um, uh, the the um, to, to U.S. based clinicians to use and measure on all of our patients. So these were a set of um, patient center measures that evaluate physical, social, and emotional health, and they were developed and validated within the general U.S. populations um, with um, a distribution of scores developed and then normalized so that they populate with, with through on a T-score distribution so that you get a, a normalized score with a population mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10, making it sort of um, universally applicable and easily interpretable. Uh, and they can be used in, because it was developed in the general population, it can be used in, 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 the, in really any patients, um, including those with chronic conditions such as cancer. And they're specific to health domains such as physical function, pain, emotional well-being, rather than a specific disease, again, so that it can be relevant across all, uh, all patients. This is uh, the different instruments that are available. There's a global health instrument, and then they break it down into physical health, mental health, and social health instruments uh, with the options there. Uh, and then what you can do is you can you pick the instruments that are relevant to you and create a customized survey. Um, once you have the instrument, then you have to figure out how are you going to administer it. So uh, this is just a, a screenshot of the NIH's uh, assessment center webpage, which is a, a web-based um, interface that the NIH developed for uh, administering the promise instruments. 
So the promised instruments can be, the questions can be obtained for free and the scoring manuals can be obtained from free, for free from the promised pages. Um, but they are um, the 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 they can if you don't have a way of, of administering them that doesn't really help. So the assessment center website was developed as a tool to solve that problem. This is a the, the web page is a fee fee service, so you can uh, for a small fee you can um, you can uh, use this to help uh, administer these surveys to your patients. Uh, but there are other ways to do it. Um, there are some EMRs that directly integrate uh, PRO instruments. So for example, Epic, which we are transitioning to at some point, um, has the Promise instruments built into them. Um, you can create your own customized web page, or there are third-party apps that, that can help with this. Um, so uh, Tonic is one that comes to mind, is the one that we use. Um, Tonic is a, is a third-party uh, company that Emory has partnered with and uses to help for data collection and data management. And with, with the help of Tonic, we were, we were able to create our surveys and integrate this into PowerChart. And that's how we did our, um, we integrated this into our practice. So now I wanna move on to discussing our pilot study where we first started integrating PROs into our lung cancer surgical care. Uh, we chose lung cancer because it's one of the most common cancer uh, diseases that we treat. It's a leading cause of cancer-related morbidity and mortality in the U.S. Uh, lung cancer surgery uh, provides a significant survival benefit for these patients, but it has a significant impact on symptoms and quality of life after surgery. These patients have a lot of uh, quality of life uh, changes after surgery, and they want to know what it's going to be like for them. And so information on symptom control and quality of life is of significant value to them. What we don't understand is we, have, we don't have a great understanding of the relationship between patient reported outcomes and quality of life with clinical comorbidities and post-operative outcomes. Do patients with a lot of comorbidities have worse quality of life after lung cancer surgery? And does that, is that related to what their post-operative clinical outcomes are like? And so that's really what we wanted to study here. And so we started this clinical trial. We published our initial results in 2017. This was a uh, prospective uh, cohort study. It was a consented, uh, a, a, a consented clinical trial. We enrolled patients through November 2014 through May 2016, and we included a total of 152 patients. Our uh, inclusion criteria were um, uh, any patient with known or suspected lung cancer that was undergoing surgery. We created our customized uh, survey, PRO survey with the Promise instruments. We started with 12 instruments. Uh, the number of questions ranged from 60 to 69 questions and took about 12 to 15 minutes to complete. Um, there was a range of questions because a few of the question, uh, a few of the instruments were computerized adaptive tests. And so the questions, I'm going to show you an example of that, but the question, the number of questions ranged depending on how the patients would answer the, answer the, answer the questionnaires. Um, clearly, this is a very long survey. It took you know, 15 minutes complete. Um, and we started specifically in the research setting with a, with a large, uh, with a, with a large survey because we had a dedicated research coordinator and research nurse to help, help us with this. We enrolled a total of 209 patients uh, in order to get to our final number of 151. 43 were excluded because they ended up not having lung cancer. Seven withdrew from the trial prior to surgery. There was one mortality within 30 days before that 30 day visit, but we had 151 patients who completed the baseline and initial post-operative survey. So we did a survey before surgery. We did one survey questionnaire at their first post-operative visit, which ended up being about um, 20, between um, 20 and 30 days after surgery. And then we did a follow-up survey at six months to see how patients were doing. So um, 23 of the patients refused uh, the six month follow-up survey. So we ended up with a total sample of 128. Uh, this is just some of the survey characteristics. Like I said, the time to complete the survey was 13 to 15 minutes. Uh, the the, um, the uh, Time frame was the initial survey was 12 days prior to surgery on uh, on average, 22 days after surgery for the first post-operative visit, and then 208 days after surgery for the sixth uh, survey. Um, and then once we collected the data, we had to figure out how to analyze it, right? So what we wanted ideally was an automated data exchange from the assessment center website, which is what we used to collect this data initially. And we wanted that to automatically integrate with the Emory EMR and our institutional STS database. So the STS database is a clinical registry that we uh, participate in that allows us to gather clinical data on our lung cancer patients. And we were hoping that we would have an automated data exchange web service that was running on a secured firewall server with everything happening in the background uh, without us having to get involved um, at the, you know, with linking data. 
sets, but you know, there are costs associated here and there were regulatory considerations. And we're talking about three different databases and three different, um, three you know, different registries. And they just, we couldn't get, make that happen. We couldn't get them to, 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 to get that to, to work. So what we ended up having to do was manually link the data after the study was completed. We, uh, the promised data and the results were exported from the assessment center, center, the SDS, our institutional SDS database, we got uh, separately. And then we had to manually link the data sets through a, a, uh, a unique uh, study identifier and medical record numbers. Uh, and so there was no, at this point in the, in our pilot study, we did not have any real-time integration. This was all done after the study was completed. So this is an example of the uh, of the physical function questionnaire. The first question is, you know, does your health limit you in hiking a couple of miles on uneven surfaces? We answer the question. It takes you to the next question, which is, are you able to do chores such as vacuuming or yard work? Third question, fourth question. And then based off of your answers, this, computer, this is a computerized adaptive test. It will determine how many questions you need to continue to answer. Can range anywhere from four to twelve for this instrument, and in the in, in this particular instance, based off of how we answered, after four questions, they were able to generate a score. Uh, uh, and and uh, I didn't show it here, but it would give you a raw score, and then it would give you the normalized t-score. And so the uh, once the surveys were completed, we looked at our results, and uh, I'm going to show you some examples of some of the the data that we were able to gather, sort of. A, a, at a population level. So this is in the 150 patients that we surveyed. Um, we looked at uh, patterns of recovery after surgery and you can see um, there's a significant decline in physical functioning after their operation. This is before surgery and this is after uh, one month after surgery, a significant decline in physical function. And then we follow them up at six months and we see recoveries back towards baseline and the patients are improving, but they're still below their baseline levels. Uh, pain scores are significantly worse after surgery. So in this case, they have the, the, the their, their PRO scores get uh, go higher. And that, again, this requires understanding your instrument, but in terms of what that means in promise is that they're reporting more pain. Whereas a physical function, the score goes lower, that means they're reporting less physical function. So for physical function, a lower score is worse. For pain intensity, a higher score is worse. So it's really important that you understand your instrument and how you wanna use it. Um, and you know, not surprising with pain scores out to six months, they return back to their baseline levels. Uh, and then we use this, this trial data, data to do some comparative effectiveness research. We looked at um, our VATS cohort, minimally invasive surgery versus our thoracotomy patients. And we saw significant differences at the preoperative and one month uh, time period. So we did not see a statistically significant difference out at six months. We looked at our um, sublobar resections versus lobectomies, and we saw that physical functioning um, shows a greater decline in our lobectomy cohorts, those who had more lung removed, at least at the one month time period, but at six months, um, they've all recovered back to their baseline levels. And this has really impacted, at least for me, how I talk to my patients, you know, whether I, you know, I tell them, yes, a lobectomy will have greater impact on your physical function at one month after surgery, but when compared to a sublobar resection, but at six months, most patients can't really tell a difference and people have recovered back to the similar levels. Um, so next we wanted to look at whether, um, what, what clinical factors and clinical comorbidities can predict greater declines in patient reported outcomes and quality of life. And so we looked at sort of uh, what we would think of as high risk surgical criteria. So the presence of coronary disease, ECOG functional status, coronary disease, and then pulmonary function. So we looked at DLCO and FEV1, and we cut them off between above and below 50% of predicted. And what we found was that DLCO is significantly predicts um, patients' quality of life after surgery. A, a low DLCO, which is shown in the red line, um, those patients report worse physical functioning before surgery, actually, um, and at six months after surgery. So what's interesting is that the initial post-operative visit, regardless of where their DLCO is, everybody declines to a similar level. But when you get out to six months, the patients with better pulmonary functions are, are recovering back towards their baseline, but patients with low pulmonary function remain significantly declined and have a much more uh, much more prolonged recovery time. Um, and it, perhaps that's not surprising in regards to physical function, but what was really surprising is we saw a similar result in pain intensity. People with worse pulmonary function report higher levels of pain after surgery, um, at least at six months. At 30 days, there was no difference. Um, and we thought we would see similar, um, similar findings with other clinical uh, comorbidities like age uh, and ECOG status and coronary disease. But what we found was those were poor predictors of quality of life after surgery. We found no difference in physical function and pain by age 
um, ECOG physical function scores did not predict uh, patient reported physical function scores after and before and after surgery. Coronary disease did not correlate. Uh, diabetes did not correlate. BMI did not correlate. It was really just the pulmonary function, which was predicting how they were doing afterwards. So then we wanted to look at, um, uh, th this is just a, a, a figure um, mapping out how DLCO relates to physical function at the six month time frame. Um, and you can see that there's a re linear relationship as your DLCO improves, your physical function sc uh, scores improve. Um, so then we wanted to look at whether, you know, up, up until this point, we were looking at patterns of quality of life after surgery. Well, we wanted to look at whether preoperative patient reported um, scores can predict postoperative clinical complications. Is your, do patients with worse physical function, are they at higher risk for surgery? What we found that the, what we found was that the incidence of complications was, um, was pretty well correlated with patient reported physical function. The worse your physical function score was, the more likely you were to have a complication after surgery. Um, so the odds of a complication um, for every 10 point decrease in your T-score was 50% higher. So for every 10 point decline in your, in your, uh, in your, in your physical function T-score, you were 50% more likely to have a complication. The odds ratio was 1.56. Uh, this didn't quite reach statistical significance. The confidence interval spanned one here and the p-value is 0 0.06, but I think this was a function mostly of sample size here. Uh, only 47 complications in our cohort. You know, if we had a larger sample size uh, and we followed, um, it, uh, did this over a, a few more years, I'm confident we would have seen in this, this response even more pronounced. Um, so those are some of the things that we were able to do in our clinical trial. And now I wanna talk about how we move this into clinical practice. So we started with an instrument of a 12 instrument survey, took 15 minutes to complete, manual linkage of data sets with the research nurse helping them do all this. Obviously this is not, this, this is not sustainable, not something that we can do in routine clinical practice. Um, and so we had to narrow down and shorten the survey. We um, you know, discussed as a group, which instruments we thought were most important to our patients, uh, most important to us for research purposes. And we narrowed it down to three instruments, physical function, dyspnea and pain intensity. Those are the ones that we thought were gonna be most important for our group of patients. Um, and then we had to come up with a way of patients being able to complete this themselves without having to go to the assessment center website and figuring out how to log in. And so we worked with, um, with Tonic, uh, which is a third party system that I mentioned. They have an app that, integrate, that can um, be used for patient data collection. You log into this app and then uh, fill out your questionnaires. It's quite simple. It's all based off of a touch screen and those results directly integrate into power charts. So we had uh, got tablet devices in each of our clinics. We were able to uh, work with the Tonic uh, team to uh, create a promise instrument of these three, these three promise instruments into a survey. Uh, and then patients are handed the iPad at their clinical, their clinic visit. They answer the questions. It takes them about five minutes to complete. It's quite simple. Um, and then the results are integrated into PowerChart in, in real time. And I'll show you how that, what that looks like into the results section of PowerChart. Um, and then we had to adjust this and, uh, and adapt as, as time, uh, uh, as we progressed into this, you know, the pandemic happened and we had to pivot towards a telehealth model uh, for, for many of our patients. And if they didn't come into clinic, they didn't complete the survey because they weren't handed the iPad. And so we had to go back to our tonic team and our power chart team and um, figure out a way for them. This was all web-based. So now what happens is our patients get a text message uh, with a, uh, a link to a web page where they can complete the surveys and that goes out to all of our patients 24 hours before their clinic visit and so now they, these are the surveys are, fin are completed before they even come into the office in many cases um, you know and so th there's a trade-off with all this right during the study uh, we had 95 percent completion rates and then when we switched this to routine clinical practice our completion rates went down uh, we have we're still at relatively high at 62 percent completion rates but 31 percent of patients um, either didn't have the time, refused, or just didn't complete the survey. And then seven patients, seven percent of people had partially completed surveys. And those, um, you know, the, there was a variety of reasons. And a couple of, we did some focus interviews with our uh, MAs in our clinic, with some of the clinicians to figure out why this was happening. Uh, and there were a few different problems that we identified. There, some people are just not familiar with using tablet devices, don't have smartphones, can't do these. Um, when we first started doing this, there were multiple clicks that were required to start each individual three, the three instruments. You had to finish one instrument, then click to start the second, then click to start the third. And so we had to combine those into a single questionnaire. 
uh, people were forgetting their logins to the assessment center and then forgetting how to log into Tonic. And we had to work to streamline that process. Uh, and then something as simple as, you know, the, while if the patients took a little break to answer a phone call, the iPads would time out and then they couldn't get logged back in. And so they couldn't complete the survey. So we had to increase the lockout time on the iPads, you know, simple things like that. And then there are clinical barriers. The, um, you know, how does this fit into the clinic workflow? That was a relatively minor barrier. Once we shortened the survey down to three, three to five minutes, most patients are able to complete this before the clinician even walks into the room to see them. But sometimes, uh, sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, a, for some patients, this is not a high priority. For some clinicians, this wasn't necessarily a high priority. It required a lot of education, both with our clinicians, with our MAs, with our patients to tell them why this was important, make sure that we start using these results and talking to patients about this. Uh, there are some costs associated with this. Uh, a lot of that cost is, um, you know, an institutional cost. Uh, for the for the tonic app or whatever your implementation system is, but there's some costs associated with this and then working to get this integrated into the EMR, which I've talked about. So now what happens is that when they complete the survey, the, the, the T-score shows up as a result here in the results section, and we can then follow this longitudinally. We also get a PDF printout of the entire survey score every time they complete it, which gives us the uh, raw score, which is here as well as the T-score and then graphs it over time. So this is a patient of mine who had a wedge resection right in this period, right about here. And they had a small decline in their physical function with the quick recovery afterwards. And then um, as, uh, as another example, this is a patient of mine who had an esophagectomy at the, right around here. So they had a significant decline in their physical function here when they came back to see me in clinic. Uh, we worked with them. This patient was having trouble swallowing. We had to, um, you know, do it. We had to dilate them, get set them up with some outpatient physical therapy, and then when they came back a month later to see me, a significant improvement in their physical function score. Uh, and now that we're doing this in routine, we're doing this in routine practice in all of our um, in all of our patients, regardless of diagnosis. There's a lot of other there's there's a lot of interesting research that we can do with this. So we looked at we wanted to look at whether we can predict who you know our decision for taking someone to surgery based off of their physical function. And when we combined the, our three PRO scores into a single uh, prediction model, we found that we can predict with about seventy percent accuracy uh, who is going to go on to have surgery based off of their preoperative. PRO scores. Um, and you might say, well, 70% accuracy, is that how great is that? Well, I'll tell you the, the most common um, number that we use to decide who's going to have uh, lung cancer surgery is your pulmonary function testing, right? And PFTs only predict with about 72% accuracy. So it's actually pretty good. Um, but, you know, these PRO scores are really indicative of, uh, of, of what many, many people will call the eyeball test. You know, you look at a patient and you see and you, you look at them and you say, how well is this person functioning? Well, this sort of quantifies that for us. Uh, we use this to look at our esophagectomy patients. And, uh, you know, we've been doing more esophagectomies minimally invasively. And so we wanted to look at um, how, do, how do the quality of life with an MIE compare with um, our more traditional open approaches. So we looked at 103 esophagectomy patients who had PRO scores. And our MIEs are in the red curve on the, on the figure on the, on the left. And our transhiatals are in the blue curve. Our transthoracic open surgeries are in the green curve. And you can see, you know, the error bars here are quite large because our um, you know, our samples are relatively low, sample sizes are relatively low here, but the, the, the curves essentially overlap. We don't see a lot of difference with our MIEs. Um, uh, we stratified this based off of complication status, thinking that patients who had a complication after esophagectomy would have much worse quality of life, uh, and they didn't. It, it's pretty comparable. The patients recover and they, they similarly, and they get better from their complications and their quality of life still recovers. Um, but, you know, I think this, this, highlight, this highlights one thing that I wanted to point out, which is choosing the right questionnaire. Um, so this is just on the left here is our, um, our, our general trends and our patient reported outcomes uh, in our esophagectomy cohort uh, with pain in red, dyspnea in blue, and physical functioning in green. But when you look at the raw score for physical functioning on the right, you can see that it's, it's all over the map. Um, and this is, uh, this could be from a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, patients who have an esophagectomy have a lot of uh, quality of life changes afterwards and the amount of quality of life changes can vary based from patient to patient. Um, but it may be that this physical function score is not granular enough and it may not be the right instrument that we're using for these esophagectomy patients. And it's a question we don't have an answer to yet. We wanna get more sample size. Um, and we need more, um, we more data, need more data here to tell if this is uh, really a, a, a problem with the instrument in this patient population, or if it's just what happens to esophagectomy patients. 
So we've talked about um, instrument development. We've talked about electronic survey administration. Um, we've talked about real-time integration. What about inclusion in national clinical registries and inclusion clin in clinical trials using this for comparative effectiveness research, right? Like we use this for some of this in our own institution, but really to guide um, uh, more, uh, more, at a more national level, what we, how we should be treating our patients, this really needs to be included in our future endeavors uh, if we want to give uh, patient-centered care. Let's focus on things that are beyond that go beyond just um, long-term survival, because this, you, I would argue that that may just not no longer be the best metric for our cancer patients. Um, so uh, um, when I went to, when we talk about clinical registries, at least for thoracic surgeons, we talk about a Society of Thoracic Surgeons database. This was established in 1989. It is uh, one of our gold standard clinical databases for thoracic surgeons. It captures clinical data on uh, the most common adult cardiac, general thoracic, and congenital operations. Dr. Fernandez is actually one of is, is the head of the national head of the STS database. He was intimately involved with this. Um, and we, we, as a society, we use this database to help us with risk prediction models, guideline development, um, monitor, you know, uh, multiple different studies looking at how patients do after, after um, cabbage lobectomies, our most common operations. But the STS database does not have any quality of life, uh, quality of life data, data in it. It does not have any PR patient reported outcomes in it. And um, as a result, you know, we've been pushing to incorporate incorporate this data into the STS database. So uh, Dr. Fernandez has created the STS Patient Reported Outcomes Task Force, which is tasked with figuring out how to incorporate this into the database. And, you know, I'm working with other surgeons from around the country who are interested in this topic to figure out how we can uh, integrate this into our STS database. Uh, and then, you know, they, we need to include these sorts of PRO endpoints in our clinical trials. And there are a variety of challenges there. There are administration issues, like how do, how do you, at multiple sites, find the same way of administering this data? Um, because, as, you know, as, the, the, the best way to, to gather this data in your clinic is going to be dependent on how you run your clinic and how, you know, it needs to be customized to each individual um, uh, clinic workflow. And so there's some administration issues there. It's hard to standardize this. There are a lot of different instruments. And so getting everybody to use the same instrument is challenging. And some of these scores are difficult to interpret, right? If you don't know what a T-score is, then what is a physical function score of 50 mean to you. And so there's some education involved with there. And a physical function score of 50 with a promise instrument is not the, doesn't mean the same thing as the uh, physical function, the, the, the PRO score from the short form 16 from the RAND survey. So, you know, it, it, it leads to a lot of, uh, there are some difficulties there. But you know, it, it's, it starts at the top. The FDA is requiring that PRO endpoints be, be included in trials for approval of new drugs and devices. And we really need to, figure out how to include these primary and secondary endpoints in our clinical trials. So in summary, PRO implementation in the clinical setting is challengeable, but it, it's doable. There are, um, you know, there are some multi, it's an iterative process. You have to get it started and then make changes and be flexible with how you go and in, in, in making improvements. But there's a lot of valuable clinical information that can be obtained from routine assessment of PRO outside of the clinical setting. Doing this on everybody can give you a lot of information about how our patients are doing um, and, and, and what we can do to improve as uh, Im improve how we treat our patients. And integration of PRO into our clinical registries and our clinical tri trials will allow for valuable and necessary patient-centered comparative effectiveness research to figure out how best to treat our patients in the future. So just a couple of acknowledgements. I want to th thank Dr. Fernandez, who's been a great mentor uh, for me ever since I started here at Emory and has got this project started and allowed me to continue to run with this and grow it. Uh, our other partners, um, Dr. Forrest Pickens and Dr. Sanchetti, have allowing me to, to intrude in their clinics and, 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 uh, and uh, being open to seeing the value in this. Um, Dr. Bernango and Dr. Ware are two statisticians who do a lot of this work for uh, with me and, uh, and and have been helping me do this research. And Dr. Gillespie has been a great mentor and a valuable resource for me in this entire process. So I will uh, stop there and take any questions uh, in the uh, question and answer um, section. I'm sorry, before we begin, thanks Dr. Kular. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located, located at the bottom of your screen. While we wait on questions, I wanna mention that there will be no grand round lecture next week due to area spring break. To view all upcoming Winship Grand Rounds lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship calendar. 
Thank you. Feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen. So there's one question here from Dr. Lawson. Can the promise or other instruments be used in lieu of the review of systems in our notes? So um, no, uh, I mean, the, the, the simple answer to that is, 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 is not at this time. Um, promise um, uh, gives you a, a score, but it doesn't actually give you an, an answer to all of our review of systems questions, which is required for billing purposes. So I don't know that it can replace it. Um, although a lot of the same, um, uh, infrastructure that's used can uh, for, for gathering these PRO scores can be used to gather review of systems um, data. So I know, you know, Tonic has the functionality of gathering, of doing a review of systems um, in their app and incorporating that into our notes. Um, we have not used that, uh, but I know it has that functionality. So a lot of the infrastructure is similar. Um, so there's a question um, from Dr. Gillespie. Uh, for other those other clinicians interested in implementing PROs in their clinics, are there specific Emory clinical resources that might be a good place uh, for them to, to start for help? Uh, yes, absolutely. There, um, you know, the 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 a, a big part of this is working with the IT team, uh, and there are contacts uh, within our IT team who uh, can help who are familiar with these instruments and can help us and help you incorporate them. Um, the one thing, one caution I would give is a lot of this is going to change with the epic transition um, because those uh, mechanisms are going to change. You know, it, before this, when we were with PowerChart, it was again this Tonic app that Emory had um, partnered with that we use, and that's going to change because Tonic doesn't work with Epic. Epic has uh, the PRO instruments uh, integrated directly into them, and so it'll involve working with the Epic team. And that leads to the next question, which is, will the Epic transition impact and change your PRO collection? And the answer is uh, yes, it will. Uh, we won't be able to use our current infrastructure um, and we're going to have to work with the epic team to figure out um, how we incorporate this into our new uh, workflow with with epic and and then we're going to have to figure out whether i'm going to be able to combine these two data sets the, the the tonic pro data with the epic pro data whether that's something that's going to have to be manually linked later on or whether that's um, can be directly incorporated and so that remains to be seen something we're in the process of working on uh, Uh, there's another question here from Dr. Bradley. What mechanism will you use to feed data into Epic instead of PowerChart? Is Tonic able to do that? So yeah, uh, I think I, I think I answered that one. Or um, but Tonic is not able to do that um, because Epic has it built into uh, it already, and I'm going to have to actually work with the Epic team. That's a that's a work in progress. Right. Uh, okay. If there if there uh, are no other questions, um, Katia, should we uh, let people go or? Yes. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Kular, um, and hope everyone have a great day. Uh, looks like one other question popped up. I'll answer that real quick. Have there been any discussions to standardize what PRO instruments are used across the cancer uh, center subsite? So at the the moment there have not been, at least not that I'm aware of, but that is certainly um, something I think that as, in, as a Winship group, we should consider, um, uh, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense, but so uh, thus far, there, as far as I'm aware, there have not been any discussions regarding that. All right, great. Are there any other questions? All right, if not, we'll be closing out. Thank you, Dr. Kular. All right, thank you everyone for listening.